We're live. Great. Thanks. Well, welcome back to Elasma Week, everyone. I'm your host for the week, Dr. David Schiffman. Elasma Week is an online outreach event about the science of elasma branks, shark skates and rays, and the scientists who study them. And this week is all about diversity. The goal is to highlight the diversity of scientists, the many ways of doing elasma brank research, and to show off as many weird and wonderful species as possible every year. Elasma Week, Elasma Week wants to make a platform where real scientists can share their love and work with the public. And tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Juliana Kadar, who is a PhD candidate at Macquarie University in Sydney with the Fish Lab. She's completed a Master of Science in Biodiversity Conservation and a Master of Research in Biology. Juliana participates in many education and outreach activities to spread awareness to students and the public about ocean health and sustainability. She's also a member of the Homeward Bound program, which is working to build and upskill a network of a thousand women in STEM over 10 years, and will be traveling to Antarctica in 2021 as part of this program. Juliana works on finding out more about the activity patterns of the Port Jackson shark using shark tags that function like Fitbits, but for sharks. Her study uses machine learning to break down the millions of data points collected by the tags into distinct behavior, behavioral signatures like resting, swimming, and feeding. With these behavior signatures, a clear picture of the Port Jackson shark's movements can be created and ultimately allow us to see what this species is doing underwater, leading to a better management of the species and its environment. The fish lab that Juliana is a part of also completes studies on shark personality, social networks, cognition, and warming ocean climates. You can follow her on Twitter and Instagram at JP Kadar, K-A-D-A-R. Take it away, Juliana. All right, thanks so much, David, for the introduction. Really happy to be here today with all of you and to share everything that is Port Jackson Shark. So um, I am part of the Fish Lab, and I'm gonna be sharing a lot about my work on biologging and also about the other studies that we're doing and the other studies my colleagues are all doing at the Fish Lab. So I'll share my screen now with you guys. Great. So like David said, uh, the tools that I'm using are basically like Fitbits, but for sharks. And this talk is gonna be all about how we're discovering new behaviors in the Port Jackson shark using these tags and using other methods that, um, that are commonly used in, in marine biology research today. And before we even begin talking about that, I think it's worth mentioning the shark PR problem that we all know so much about now and we actually have to deal with on a daily basis. So, you know, back when JAWS was made, um, it really led to a change in opinion and attitude toward sharks in general. And it's a funny experiment you can do if you jump on Google and you type in sharks, this is what you get uh, when you type that in, sharks eating people, sharks with teeth and sharks with lasers and attacking people in real life. And to me, this just represents how far this is from the truth. So sharks are probably not just, you know, bloodthirsty killing machines. And, and we as marine scientists are trying to just communicate that to, to everyone who will listen, that they actually lead these amazingly complex lives. And, um, and there's a lot we don't yet understand about them. And to think about uh, just what the odds are when, when you're thinking about getting attacked by a shark, it works to put that into perspective. If you think about uh, taking a selfie or standing under a coconut tree or using a vending machine, for example. So you're more likely to have something dangerous or untoward happen to you by doing any one of those things than ever be attacked by a shark. And in reality, we know that most sharks are harmless. So there's over a thousand species of sharks and rays. And um, like you can see here, the, the horn shark and the Port Jackson shark that I also work with. And, and they don't all look the same way that you would think a typical shark looks like a, like a great white or a tiger or a bull shark. And if we look at the teeth of the Port Jackson shark, for example, you can also see that not all sharks have large serrated teeth. Like, like what a typical uh, shark tooth might look like. And we have this really cool uh, 3D video of what a Port Jackson shark jaw looks like up close. 
And you can see these small little spiky teeth on the front. And then in the back, these crushing plates where the shark actually uses these to grind up prey that have hard shells that are found on the bottom of the seafloor. So you can already see by this shark's dentition how different and how uh, di different of a life it leads by, by uh, just what it looks like here. And so when we're thinking about the shark status uh, overall in the world and what kind of roles they play, um, we know right now, according to the IUCN Red List, that a quarter of all sharks and ray species are threatened. And there's actually a recent mega study in nature that looked at uh, coral reefs across the world and found that 19% of sharks are actually missing from those coral reefs. And this is troubling because we know that sharks are exerting really important top-down influences on their surrounding environments. And without their presence, you know, there, there are these cascading effects that are likely to happen that could affect food webs and hundreds of other species that are involved in them. And I'm actually lucky enough to work with a species the Port Jackson shark that isn't threatened or vulnerable at all. It's really common across Australia and it's not important to humans. Uh, we don't use it for food or anything like that, but it is commonly caught as bycatch. And, um, and you know, we thought that because these sharks are so common, they're likely having really large impacts on their surrounding environments. You can see here their distribution across Australia. These sharks are everywhere. So they're found from Northern New South Wales in that blue area there, all the way down South to Tasmania and then across to the West Coast uh, and up the coast there on the West Coast of Australia. And the area that we work in is in Sydney Harbor and just a few hours South of Sydney Harbor in Jervis Bay. And when you look closely at this shark, first you can see that it's just a beautiful species. It has this really unique harness pattern across its whole body that goes over its eyes, along its back and down its pectoral fins. And it also has two sharp spines in front of each dorsal fin. And on the picture of the, on the right is how you can most commonly see them during the day, which is just resting on the bottom of the ocean floor, pumping water, over their gills because they actually don't need to swim to breathe like many other shark species. And what was going on inside of Australia was that they were kind of magically appearing inside of our harbors and bays and then uh, you know, disappearing after each winter was over. And people just didn't know where they were going, but they knew that they were showing up inside of Sydney Harbor and Jervis Bay to breed for their mating season. And while they're breeding inside of these places, um, they're producing lots and lots of eggs. And the picture on the left you can see is a Port Jackson shark egg. And I don't know if any of you have ever held one, but they're just really unique because they're, they feel just like seaweed and they're shaped in this corkscrew pattern. And this corkscrew pattern is what allows them to actually just go down into rock crevices and stay there for 10 to 12 months until the hatchlings hatch out of these eggs. And if you go there at about 10, 11 months time when they're almost ready to hatch, that little mucus plug has disappeared from the egg and you can unwind it a tiny bit and see this perfect baby shark inside of this egg, uh, which is really cool. But Unfortunately, these eggs have about a 90% mortality rate, so many of them don't make it to that hatching point. And the, the other thing we know about Port Jackson sharks is that they're feeding on mollusks and echinoderms like urchins. Um, so this hard shelled prey um, that their teeth are perfectly adapted to grinding and crushing and things like that. And so when we didn't know very much about these sharks yet, what scientists did was that they went down into uh, Jervis Bay and they put a number of visual tags on some of these sharks. And then a single opportunistic sighting of one of these sharks down near Tasmania led to the hypothesis that these sharks are actually migratory. They're migrating these long distances. So that led to the creation of Team PJ, Port Jackson Shark. 
And we're led by Professor Cullen Brown at Macquarie University. And we're just a collection of PhDs, postdocs, uh, master's students. And we cover everything from shark activity and movement, which is me, to, of course, stable isotopes, uh, shark cognition, metabolic rates and temperature, learning and memory, personality, and migration. And if anybody is interested out there in volunteering, none of the work we do would be possible without so many amazing volunteers. And many of us that work in shark labs are always looking for people to help. So, so get out there and volunteer if you want to get involved, definitely. And we started with this migration idea as well. So we headed down to Jervis Bay, which is a few hours south of Sydney on the east coast of Australia. And it's this really big bay down here. And as you can see, it's a pretty beautiful place to work. Um, even though we were there in the winter time and it was really cold, it was still uh, the best part of each year for us. And how we started studying migration was by implanting these acoustic tags inside of the body cavity of the sharks. So what we do first is catch the sharks by hand on either scuba or snorkel. And then we implant this acoustic tag into the body cavity of the sharks. And while we're doing this short surgery, which takes about five or six minutes, the sharks are actually anesthetized. So they're, they're knocked out. And, um, and when the shark, uh, when that's complete, we actually revive the shark and we just put it back into the water, make sure that it's um, healthy and alert, and then we let it go. And these tags allow us to track the shark's movements for up to uh, 10 years, actually. And I know this was mentioned in some of the talks before too with the acoustic tagging, but this is how they work. Um, this small cylinder, black cylinder here is the actual acoustic tag. And then that's implanted in and it sets off a series of pings that are individual to that tag's ID. And when the shark swims within 400 meters of one of these acoustic receivers that's out inside of the bay, then we know when and where that's happened and we can get an idea of the movements from that. And each one of these red points here on this map is one of our acoustic receivers inside of Jervis Bay. So basically there's a lot of them. And if a shark goes inside or outside of the bay, we're gonna know about it. And we're gonna know how often and, um, and how long it's spending at each one of these coral reefs um, and, and reefs inside of this bay here. And not only are there these receivers, but there are many receivers up and down the north and south uh, coasts of, of here as well. So if the shark migrates north or south, we, we know about that as well. And here are some of our first findings from the first three years of the study. Um, we, you can see the female sharks in the darker color here and the male sharks in the lighter color. And basically what's happening is that the, the males were arriving first in the harbors and bays and the females were arriving about a month later. And we think this is because the males are actually staking out territory um, and, and waiting for those females to arrive. And that's what you can see on the right here is a mating attempt by one of those males on a larger female. And you can see her, uh, you can see the male shark grab one of the fins on the female and then the female just uh, escaping and swimming away. And you can see a visible egg on her underside there. Um, so she's ready to lay an egg as well. And we think that the females are actually staying one month later than the males because they wanna reduce egg predation on their eggs. So the Port Jackson sharks are actually known to predate upon their own eggs, as well as many other species are eating them as well. So by staying longer, the females are reducing that chance that, that these eggs are predated upon. And the next thing that we could see from all of this data was that there's a huge amount of site fidelity or, or site loyalty that these sharks are displaying. And this is really unique among shark species. So we could see that 97% of detections for males are from a single reef and only 83% are, are, um, are for females. So males are a bit more loyal and they stay at those reefs um, more consistently than females do. And then we could also see that 64% of females 
and 100% of males return to the same breeding reef each year. So 100% of males, all the males we studied are returning to that very same breeding reef each year. So that's a huge amount of site fidelity or loyalty that's happening there. And when I would go out into the reefs and search certain caves that we knew had poor Jackson sharks, I was running into the very same individuals at the very same caves each year. So, so there's a huge amount of, of uh, just consistency in the sharks movements. And, um, and it's pretty amazing to see these navigation abilities that they have in action. And what we could also see about their migration patterns was that most of the Jervis Bay population was migrating south down to Bass Strait near Tasmania. And then of course they were returning um, each year in the winter time to breed. But we also saw that there's, there was a really big amount of individual variation uh, within these sharks and that they weren't all doing the same thing. So some of them were actually going north, some of them were going south and some of them were going off the continental shelf. And actually not all of them were making the migration each year. So it's possible that if the shark didn't have the energy reserves um, to make the migration all the way to the north, then it would just wait out that year and then go the next year after that. And, and this was important because we, we were thinking about how these nutrient rich waters in the south are actually um, really important to, to the sharks and how when they move north, they're carrying all of these nutrients in the form of their eggs to the north. So we believe that they're actually functioning as really important nutrient belts from the south to the north as they migrate each year. When it came to migration speed, we could see some differences between the sexes as well. So the males were moving faster than the females and the trip south was actually faster than the trip north. And if anybody has seen, which I'm sure we all have, Finding Nemo, um, we know that the EAC is used by many different animals to travel south. And we think the sharks may also be taking advantage of this East Australian current to, uh, to help their journeys south as well. And so after we collected all of this data from these amazing acoustic tags, we had a lot of rough scale information. We knew what was happening with the sharks over months and years, um, but we, we didn't yet know what was happening on a fine scale. So over days and hours and seconds. And this picture is, is pretty uh, you know, iconic to me because it just reminds me of what we as marine biologists see on a daily basis when we go out into the field, which is just the horizon, the ocean, um, openness and nothing else. So you can imagine how hard it is to study some of these species in the open ocean and, uh, and not be able to spend as much time as you would out there studying them or observing them because they're just so difficult to follow around. And, and this is why tagging technology is such a great and, and um, just amazing thing that's happened in the last few decades. And it's led to kind of a new frontier that's, that's been great for terrestrial scientists as well as marine biologists. And you can see you can tag something as large as a whale shark or as small as a chipmunk. And what's happened is that these tags that we're using have really increased in battery storage ability, uh, memory storage, and they've also decreased in price. So that's what's led to an explosion in the last few decades in the use of these tags. Even though the first tagging study on fish was in the 70s, there's now many, many more of them. And because these tags produce a lot of data, millions of data points, we as biologists and ecologists are turning to data science to uh, understand how to best analyze this data. And, uh, and this has to be my favorite picture here of a tag ever, which is just on a seal here with his buddy looking at him like, like what is that, what's going on? Um, and there's also research into, into that of how the visual aspects of tagging plays into how animals interact with each other, which is also interesting. So what's actually inside of these tags is an accelerometer. And, um, and what an accelerometer is, is the same thing that's found inside of your Fitbits or your cell phones that's basically just tracking your movement, tracking your steps over time. And the little tag you can see here is the shark tag that we use 
um, on the Port Jackson shark. And what it's doing, again, is measuring change in velocity over time. So it's measuring Gs or gravity and in three dimensions. So if the shark moves forwards or backwards, side to side or up and down, uh, we can see that in the data. And, and what we see when we download that is a picture or a graph of, of a shark behavior or a behavior signature as we call them. And it's pretty, it's pretty simple to uh, interpret because in the first half of this graph is what you might see when the shark is resting. And then in the second half of this graph is what it might look like when the shark starts swimming. So you see more peaks when there's movement. And then when you take out the acceleration of this, of this data, you can also get an idea of the animal's body posture. So whether it's uh, like swaying from side to side or rolling or things like that. And then our methods for beginning this tagging study, this biologging study, were, uh, were starting out in Sydney Harbor. So we actually went out into Sydney Harbor and caught 10 sharks. We brought them back to Taronga Zoo and we tagged them with these tags uh, and then recorded them using high definition video footage. And this allowed us to sync the tag data to the video footage so we could be sure what the behavior signatures meant because we, we could ground truth that resting looked like this and chewing looked like this and, uh, and also mating looked like this and, and swimming definitely had these peaks in it. And then after we did that, we built models, uh, machine learning models that basically classified all of these behavior signatures automatically for us because there's no way that we could go through all that data manually and classify all those millions of data points. So that's where this, um, this automatic statistics really came in handy. And after we built those models, we ranked them and we saw which one was the best at determining which behavior was which. So sometimes the models would confuse things like resting and chewing behavior because the shark is chewing while it's resting, for example. And so we wanted to make sure we had the best model possible that was gonna make the fewest mistakes possible. And, um, and then after we chose the best model, we applied this model to wild data from tagged wild sharks that we couldn't actually follow around or record on video. So that's how we went about this whole process. And I'll just show you guys visually what, that, what those methods looked like. Um, this was us just catching and tagging the sharks at, at Taronga Zoo. You can see the, uh, the accelerometer tag on the dorsal fin of one of the males here. The tag looks a bit bigger on the shark because the males are a little bit smaller. They're only about a meter or 3.3 uh, feet long. And the females are about one and a half meters or up to five feet long. And then we observe the sharks at the zoo. Like I mentioned, you can see them in their enclosure here. And we had a really clear view of what they were doing 24 hours a day. And this is the behavior, one of the behaviors that we were most interested in, this chewing behavior, foraging behavior that you see here. So I've lined up my three video cameras with each other. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at this female here as she's chewing. And then you have some interesting behavior from one of the other sharks and uh, interrupting that chewing behavior too. But on the right, you can see what the accelerometer data actually looks like um, and how it's changing uh, as she's chewing on that small bit of squid. And after we chose our best algorithm, we went out and we started catching wild sharks. So this is how we did it in Jervis Bay. Um, the sharks are really docile and easy to handle. Um, just a reminder to not try this at home, of course. We don't handle sharks unless we have to because it stresses them and there's no reason to do this other than for scientific research. So um, they're, they're quite easy to catch and you just grab the tail or the pectoral fin and you tuck them under your arm like that. And then we slowly just brought them up to the boat after that. And, uh, and we were able to just move them along really slowly because we know that gravity and these things have quite a large effect on these sharks. And when you're tagging them out on the wild, you actually have to get rid of the first 24 hours or so of data because they express just abnormal activity patterns for that amount of time. And once we have them on the boat, we tag them um, using 
this tag. And you'll probably notice that this tag looks a little bit different than the tag we were using in captivity. This one is actually even more souped up. It has a, a gyroscope in it, in addition to an accelerometer and a depth sensor, as well as temperature sensor and a magnetometer. So it can measure a uh, magnetic field of the earth as well to see if that's affecting the shark's movements. And then after we were finished with tagging, we would actually release the shark. Uh, we would take it back down to where we found it and, and just lay it on the ground and hope that it, it stayed in the general area because about a week later, we would come back and try to track the shark. And our tags are actually designed to not float to the surface like many other shark tagging studies. Our sharks are hanging out in caves and in reefs so they were getting caught in those areas. So we had to actually design our tag to stay attached to the shark for a period of time. And, um, and then we would actually find the whole shark and remove the tag that way. So I've got my hand on a pole here that's connected to an underwater hydrophone. And then I'm turning that around in a circle to see where the pinging sound is loudest. So I can follow that and zoom in on the location of the shark. And then once we've done that, we get in the water and I have this handy underwater hydrophone that lets me narrow in even further on the shark's location. And that usually takes about four to five minutes underwater. And then we retrieve the tag underwater and let the shark go that way. And, and like I mentioned, these tags, even after just one week recording at 10 Hertz or 10 times per second, they're recording like 18 million data points. So this is a huge amount of data to process and to try and categorize. And that's where the, the tag analysis or machine learning comes in handy. And so we can make a comparison here with machine learning, which is basically just the labeling of stuff using examples to your brain, which is amazing at labeling. And when you look at this picture here, you automatically see this is a dog, your brain is, is really good at getting that right away. Um, and what machine learning does is it says here, look at a bunch of examples of dogs and non-dogs and learn the difference and, and label it yourself, figure it out yourself. Um, and that, that works most of the time and it works really well, but we all know that in real life, things can get a bit more complicated. So when you look at this picture, even your brain has difficulty distinguishing which one is a dog and which one is a muffin, for example. And so we had to find the best possible solution, um, the best possible model to differentiate between our resting and chewing and swimming and other behavior signatures that we wanted to identify. So we looked at three different types of models, ensemble models, which are basically like, um, like trees, like, uh, like a set of uh, yes or no trees put together. And we also looked at nonlinear models, which is like a classification tree, a simple yes or no uh, single tree, and then also neural networks. And we found that ensemble models like uh, random forests were actually the best solution to our problem of classifying this Port Jackson shark data. So what did we actually find from, from all, of this, all of this work? First, that the sharks are completely nocturnal. Um, many other shark species are crepuscular, so they're more active at sunrise and sunset, but Port Jackson sharks have these amazing adaptations to function really well at night. And they're basically just getting up and active after the sun sets and then peaking activity just before midnight and then decreasing before the sun comes up. And when we zoom in even further on this data, here you can see um, a female's activity patterns for just over a minute in time, um, so 70 seconds in time. And you can see her transitioning from swimming to resting to chewing behavior with small peaks and then vertical swimming behavior. And from this, we could see that the sharks are foraging at shallower locations and the males are actually foraging more than the females. And to us, this emphasized that these Port Jackson sharks are really important factors in regulating urchin populations in these coastal areas. And we know that urchins eat kelp and kelp forests make up the abundance of the great southern reef that we have here in Australia and in many other parts of the world as well. 
So if there were to be a change in movement patterns or distribution of the Port Jackson sharks, there would be a change in the number of urchins. And then we would see these cascading effects resulting for the kelp populations and all of the species that depend on them as well. And then the other behavior that we looked at that was pretty interesting was this vertical swimming behavior. And this is different than our wild study, but this actually has implications for shark welfare in captivity, because we noticed that in our data, of course, only the captive sharks were performing this vertical swimming behavior and the wild sharks were not. So in this video, you can see one of the female sharks um, wearing a harness attachment, which is a different type of attachment that we just tried out in captivity. And she does this vertical swimming behavior for a couple of seconds here, right about now when she turns vertical like that. And this has a high ODBA value, so overall dynamic body acceleration, which has a high energetic cost for the animal. So this is an interesting piece of information to look at when we're thinking about shark welfare in captivity. And this was the piece that I was most excited about, I think, um, in, in my biologging research, that the sharks held in captivity actually increased in activity levels when the wild sharks started migrating. So you can see a graph here, which is basically just representing how there were a lot of sharks in the wild and then very few sharks as they left for migration. And then you could see that the sharks in captivity displayed normal and low activity while the sharks were there in the bay. But when the sharks left, the captive sharks got a lot more active. And this was exciting to see because we identified this as a form of migratory restlessness, which is really commonly described in birds. There is a popular experiment that people do um, where they actually place birds inside of a funnel and then they see the birds trying to move north or, uh, or south. And then if the bird is trying to migrate south, it becomes more active toward the south facing edge of that funnel. And this was also seen in other species like salmon and eel, but this was the first time it was actually identified in a shark species. So we wanna definitely look more into this type of behavior. And for these biologging studies, because there's so much potential with them, we have a lot of future aims and future things we wanna do, um, like using these tags with the extra environmental sensors to see what kinds of environmental variables are influencing the shark's movements. And so, uh, we want to look at things like pH, uh, ocean acidity, and also temperature and, um, and magnetometry and things like that. And then the second thing we have to do is look at our models more closely and make sure that we're not just assessing them based upon the accuracy of the model, but also how quick they are and how scalable they are. Because there's a lot of potential here to do just onboard instant processing um, inside of these tags, for example. Like imagine having a tagged animal go out into the ocean and then getting regular updates to your phone about the behaviors that they're performing. So there's a lot of potential here to develop these models further and make them even more automated. So in, uh, in the last few, few slides here, I wanna share with you guys the other studies that my colleagues and lab mates are doing and what we've found out about the Port Jackson shark um, when it comes to other methods and techniques. And one of these is social networks. So social networks are basically just asking the question of whether sharks have preferred resting mates or friends. Um, and you can see one of the graphs here, that's an output of one of these studies. So each one of these circles is an individual shark. And then the lines between them are the associations they have with each other. So the thicker the line, the stronger the association between those two sharks. And the way that we study this is by using not the 400 meter, um, uh, receiver that, that we have there, but the smaller range detection receivers that you can use for this. So something that's detecting a shark's presence within 10 meters, or even placing the tag on the shark and it detecting uh, other sharks within four meters. So it's basically a roving receiver itself. 
And what we found was that the, the sharks have preferences. Um, they are assorting themselves by sex and by size, but there was no preference for genetic relatedness uh, in their resting patterns or who they're resting with. We were also really interested in their navigation abilities. So uh, do they have a cognitive map of their surroundings of a place like Jervis Bay? And how are they so good at finding their home reefs? And this is still in progress right now, but one of the studies we used to do this was um, by just grabbing one shark from its home reef at this red star on Orion Beach and then moving this shark to another reef, one of these green stars, or we moved it to the middle of the bay here in Jervis Bay. And we analyzed this and, and tried to collect this data by using uh, active and passive acoustic telemetry. And active acoustic telemetry has to be one of the most painful ways to collect data, but it creates a beautiful image of what we're looking for. So we basically uh, go out and we tag the shark after, sunrise, after sunset, and then we follow the shark all night long into the next day, tracking its location every couple of seconds and, and putting that into the GPS system. So it's a very time consuming, but it, it creates a really nice, nice image in the end. And, um, and what we were able to see so far is that females and sharks released in the middle of the bay take a longer time to return home. So again, it's emphasizing that males have that really strong sight fidelity and that the middle of the bay is keeping the sharks from identifying those cues, visual or olfactory, having to do with sense of sight or sense of smell that are helping the sharks along in their navigation ability to reach their home reef. And with our genetic studies, we found so far that Borchaks and sharks are exhibiting male bias dispersal. So the males are the ones moving around, um, but they have to be doing that while they're juveniles. So they're facilitating this gene flow between populations when they're of a younger age. And of course, stable isotopes. I know we are all big fans of that. Um, so the males actually have lower carbon, higher nitrogen, heavy isotopes. And this is the science of you are what you eat. So we're able to see that females are eating less pelagic food items, so things like fish, and, um, and males are, uh, are the ones eating things like that. And then females are mostly eating things like urchins and bottom dwelling prey. And this study was actually mentioned earlier too, and I'm just bringing it up again because I think it's amazing as well that um, the, when it comes to sensory systems and learning, um, one of our colleagues, Katerina Villapuka, was able to uh, teach juvenile sharks to associate uh, jazz music with a food reward. So these juvenile sharks were able to make that association. So this visual cue was able to, to be taught to them um, in a small period of time. And we also did a study with adult sharks where we looked at how, uh, whether this, uh, whether this uh, visual cue was able, sorry, I think I said visual cue earlier, but I meant uh, auditory cue. So the, the first study was with juveniles and music, and the second study was with adults and a visual cue. And we know that of course, Port Jackson sharks are nocturnal and they have more rods than cones in their eyes. So we gave them a black square to look at on a white piece of paper. And, um, and then we, we were able to make them make that association between a black square and a food reward. And, um, and then just, they were able to learn that in about seven weeks time. And when it came to shark personality, um, this is a really commonly studied axis of personality, the shy, bold axis on fish. And the, the males and the females, both as they were adults, displayed this flight or fight response when we, when we expressed a, um, a stressful situation for them. And, uh, and they either just responded by freezing when we caught them or by really trying to get away. And uh, this basically showed that even in the wild, we're able to conduct these studies on shark personality and uh, the sharks are displaying unique individual patterns when it came to that. And for the juveniles, we also conducted a study where we exposed them to a novel environment. And based on the time taken for them to exit 
uh, a box, we looked at whether these sharks were bold or shy in that way, and whether they had these exploratory tendencies. Um, and they were different in how they tended to explore their environments as well. So uh, ocean warming in sharks. So this is something that uh, many of us are really interested now that we're facing changing ocean temperatures. And we looked at this by identifying whether laterality plays a role in shark uh, changes in behavior. And laterality basically means left or right handedness. Uh, and when it comes to the sharks, that's just turning left or right. And some of these hatchlings were raised at plus three degrees Celsius. So at projected ocean temperatures that, that we're expecting to see in the coming decades. And they showed increased laterality when they were raised at these temperatures. So this means that there is evidence that sharks are susceptible to the effects of future ocean warming. So to cover all of that um, and, and to just summarize what we've, what we've mentioned so far, the Port Jackson sharks, we found them to undertake large annual migrations relative to their size of about one meter to a meter and a half in length. They also show really high site fidelity or loyalty to their home reefs. Uh, they have social networks or friends and they can learn and form associations and also remember things. Um, they have individual personalities and they also display sex differences when migrating and feeding. And then of course, uh, they, they are probably susceptible to warming ocean climates as well. And just tying that back into the original idea in the beginning of this whole presentation, the, that sharks are these bloodthirsty killing machines. Um, what, what I wanna break down is that, you know, they, they actually do lead these amazingly complex lives and they, they need our protection to, for, to perform these key functions in the ocean. And, um, and one way we can do that is just by, by learning more about them and breaking down these stereotypes around them. So uh, thanks very much for, for listening. And um, thanks to team PJ, all of my colleagues and lab mates that have done a lot of this amazing research. Um, and also to Taronga Zoo, where we conducted a lot of these studies and for Elasma Week for, for hosting all of us. This has been a really great week of talks. And, um, and of course, Miss Elasmo for, uh, for hosting these talks on YouTube. Um, what a great organization. Thanks for, thanks for having us and um, looking forward to seeing what you guys will do next as well. Thanks a lot. Great, thanks Juliana. That was a great talk. Uh, and for those of you uh, watching live, a reminder that we'll have more talks uh, tomorrow night. And Juliana, as well as the other speakers, will be here Sunday evening to answer your questions live. So if you have questions about the talk you just saw, leave them as a comment on the YouTube video itself. Tweet them at Juliana or tweet them at Elasma Week. And have a great night, and I will see everyone tomorrow.